What can Edmonton do? I would suggest assess vulnerabilities and opportunities with regard to food, transport, housing, heating. Identify community groups already working on building resilience or a post-carbon infrastructure. Get those groups together, get them working perhaps in a transition model. And make both long-term adaptation plans and crisis management plans for our transition away from fossil fuels. Economic contraction is not a popular idea, but it is the reality that we're going to be dealing with over the course of the 21st century. So it's important, at least for policymakers, to understand that we have to begin to think more locally, more in terms of slow and renewable, and reusing and repairing. The 21st century is not going to look like the 20th century. It's not going to be simply an extension of business as usual. It's going to be a very different time. And if we're willing to seize the opportunities inherent in this tremendous transition, then in fact, again, I believe that life can be better and that our, our descendants will look back on us and thank us for having the courage to face these realities and take a leap forward. Thank you very much. Edmonton is going to have to see fossil fuels as a, um, a, a temporary bridge to a very different future. Over the short term, as long as it takes for Edmonton to reduce its dependence on fossil fuels economically and in terms of infrastructure, uh, during that time, it's going to be a wild ride. It, it's hard to forecast uh, a momentous uh, event like that beforehand and know exactly how it's going to play out. Uh, the, we were, many of us were, even five or ten years ago, talking about the likelihood of an oil price spike that would then kill the economy and there, thereby kill also oil demand, causing oil prices temporarily to go down and then so that we would, so that the major impact of peak oil would be increasing price volatility. And I think that has borne out. I think we were exactly right in forecasting that. Now, exactly how this is going to play out over how long a period of time, I don't know. Because the, the, the economic recession of the last 18 months has, in effect, delayed the peak for prob probably another couple of years. Because oil demand has declined, by two, three million barrels a day, maybe more than that. In effect, we, we have a, a little cushion of time in which to adapt and, and make other plans. So I, I hope that you know, world leaders are, understand that and take advantage of this, this short period of time for adaptation and rather than just you know, frittering it away. Well, I think the, the, the technology is likely to come too slowly to be of much help. Uh, for example, there, there are new techniques being developed uh, for tertiary oil recovery from existing oil fields. Um, <clears throat> it's unlikely that, that that technology is going to be applied to any large degree before about 2020. And even in that case, it's only going to be applicable in certain kinds of oil fields and certain situations, so extrapolating across the board on the basis of you know one test case is often often very uh, problematic. And, and I also point to what's going on with natural gas right now. We have in North America the new shale gas plays that appear to be a, a total game changer. Suddenly we have lots more natural gas than we thought we, we had just because we have this new extraction technology with horizontal drilling and, and rock fracturing. But it turns out that those, uh, those shale gas wells deplete very rapidly and the drilling costs are much higher. So it really only makes sense to use this technology if natural gas prices are significantly higher, say in the range of seven, eight, nine dollars a thousand cubic feet instead of two or three dollars. So again, it's part of this uh, price adjustment, you know, it's part of that Goldilocks price band, you know, where it suddenly the, 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 the price that we need resources to be at in order to uh, justify development of new production capacity is increasing with every passing year. Meanwhile, there's only so much of a high price that the economy can withstand. So I don't see that really as being m much of a solution. If we don't have a transition strategy in place, 
away from fossil fuels, and we continue to be overwhelmingly dependent on fossil fuels, then people will go after them wherever they are, and it's going to be very, very difficult to get any binding climate legislation, because as we saw actually in Copenhagen, when you have uh, countries like China and the United States that are so overwhelmingly dependent on these fuels for economic growth, and, and we believe that ec economic growth is the sine qua non, the absolute essential you know, for, for political stability and all the rest, then you know, it doesn't matter what piece of paper gets signed or what target is, you know, we agree to. The reality is we'll be extracting those fuels as fast as we can and burning them. Well, I'm very happy to see rapid transit and the plans, at least, to expand that to cover all the quadrants of, of the city. I understand there is a discussion uh, already in place in uh, Edmonton regarding uh, local food systems. And I, I haven't heard the details of that, but it's, it's important that that's, that's happening. It, I, I can, there are lots of things that I could suggest uh, that, that Edmonton could do that would, that would be helpful, um, increasing farmers' markets in more locations, for example, and, and we could go on. But there is an environmental plan being formulated now. And input into that vi environmental plan, I think, would be very important from citizens to su to question. Well, what is you know what's our plan for uh, for climate change for peak oil? There is some hope that so-called third-generation biofuels, uh, biodiesel from algae, uh, ethanol from cellulosic sources, switchgrass, and so on, may be less damaging uh, to the environment uh, and and more scalable. But there are a lot of technical problems still to be overcome. Uh, I have a number of friends close to the, the algae, bio, biodiesel algae industry, and it's, it, it's an indus, industry in theory only at present. There is nowhere on planet Earth you can go right now to buy a gallon of biodiesel made from, from algae. And similarly, there's no place you can go right now to buy a gallon of ethanol made from switchgrass. It's all at the experimental stage. Uh, so I, I would guess that uh, over, over the short term, over the next 10 years, there's very little that uh, biofuels will be able to do, either to reduce our uh, vulnerability to high oil prices or to uh, uh, make our transport systems more sustainable. Yes, certainly electric rail is a very, very good alternative because most of our renewable sources of energy are going to give us electricity, whether it's solar or wind or geothermal or tidal power. All of those are going to give us electricity, not liquid fuels. So the more electric transport we have, by f the better off we will be by far. Now, that won't necessarily come in the form of electric cars because electric cars are, are going to be a, a very long-term and partial sort of solution. It takes about 20 years to change out the auto fleet. Uh, not everybody buys a new car every year. And the number of electric vehicles coming on market is going to be very small for the first few years. So we're looking at a very long-term strategy and one that we frankly may not be able to afford. So building electric public transport infrastructure is going to be a much, much better option. First of all, I would recommend investing in your local community because that's what you will have to fall back upon. That's where you'll be living and your, your first uh, uh, priority is going to be having a functional, viable local community to live in. So I, I would encourage everyone to invest first locally and then invest in what is truly sustainable over the long term, whether it is uh, food, whether it is building houses that are zero energy houses, uh, whether it is uh, uh, alternative renewable energy uh, infrastructure. Those are the kinds of investments ultimately that are going to, to pay off, not only financially, but also in terms of our community, our quality of life. Thank you very much.